Today our guest speaker is uh, Professor uh, Scott Beach. Scott Beach is the professor of uh, got it, Paul K. C. Chang, professor of jurisprudence and conduct in Hong Kong University. And uh, the topic he's going to talk about is do duties coexist rights and a historical and sociological analysis. Scott uh, worked with me many years ago. We were together, right? And we did together in smoke together at <clears throat> Macquarie University. And then he left Macquarie to, to Glasgow to, to the position professorship in Glasgow University. And then from Glasgow to, to Hong Kong. And I understand that your talk today is based on your recent book about the um, obligations, right? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you again to uh, the centre here for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, spend time with, uh, with you all this week. Okay, so my, my title uh, was this, Do, uh, do Duties Pre-Exist Rights? Do Duties Pre-Exist Rights? And uh, as Adam said, uh, it's partly based on uh, or a part of this, what I'm going to talk about is in this uh, new book called Obligations, uh, New Trajectories in Law that came out uh, last year. So let me uh, uh, suggest three ways uh, that we might think about answering this question. Do duties pre-exist rights? First would be analytically. Do duties uh, pre-exist rights as a matter of um, analytical legal philosophy. The problem that we encounter immediately is uh, the one associated with Hoppelt's analysis of uh, rights and duties, uh, of dual correlates and dual opposites. And the, the problem there is that they, are, they correlate. So if you have a right, you have a corresponding uh, duty. So in that sense, duties can't uh, pre exists rights, they come together, they, they necessarily uh, are connected. Well, that can't be the end of the story. There are two things that we might say about this uh, by expanding our analytical framework slightly. The first is something that uh, one finds in the work of Jeremy Waldron, and that is, he says, for any particular right, we have what he describes as waves of duty. So if you imagine dropping a, a stone into, into water, it has ripples. Yeah. That analogy is you have one right, but you have waves of duties that follow on that. So in other words, you have a right, but many obligations, okay? For example, I think this is the example he uses. The right not to be tortured is a basic human right. From that, he says, we can see that there are multiple obligations. There are obligations, for example, on the police force not to torture detainees, on army who arrest or detain uh, enemy combatants. But there are also further duties, which are duties to educate uh, soldiers or police officers about the standards of, of uh, uh, rights discourse there. In other words, um, for one duty, we have multiple obligations. Now, that means that the correlative, singular correlative model may not be accurate, but it doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that duties pre-exist rights. It means that they all come together. So that doesn't really help us answer the question. In fact, what Waldron is concerned about is taking rights seriously. How do we take rights seriously? Well, we should take duties seriously as well. And when we do that, we see that there are multiple duties here. Um, okay, so in that sense, we don't have uh, the pre-existence of duties. We just have a slightly uh, more nuanced account uh, of the relation or the kinds of relations between rights and duties. So the second kind of answer analytically uh, to this would be to look historically. Now, it's clearly the case that obligations or duties, for me, the terms are the state interchangeable, that duties pre-exist rights, because for most of human history, there were no such things as rights. 
but they were things like duties. So in that sense, if one looks historically, we can see that uh, rights in the, in the form that we've come to know them only emerge relatively late in Western uh, legal uh, history, Western legal thinking. Here's a quote from Alistair McIntyre from After Virtue. He says this, there is no expression in any ancient or medieval language correctly translated by our expression, a right, until near the close of the Middle Ages. The concept lacks any means of expression in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, or Arabic until around 1400, let alone Old English or in Japanese, even as late as the mid 19th century. So when one looks historically, even in the Western tradition, never mind in the Chinese tradition that has no uh, account of rights or, or the Judaic, uh, they are the Japanese, there is no account of rights there, but there is a strong, in each of these traditions, there is a strong account of duties. So in that sense, if we were going to answer the question historically, we would say, yes, duties have pre-existing rights because they've been around for a lot longer uh, than rights have. So in that sense, there's a priority uh, of duties here, both historically, uh, um, but also, I think, culturally and intellectually. When we look at religious discourse, it, it could be Judaism or Christianity, right up until the, uh, the 16th, 17th century, the priority for organizing uh, the, these religious cosmologies laid the duties. People's duties uh, were the prime uh, substance, you might say, of the normative relations. There were no rights discourse. That uh, only emerged later as a complex historical uh, set of intellectual developments. So analytically then, we might say uh, the whole felt correlative uh, issue can be troubled uh, in these two ways, by the, the sort of waves of duty analysis, and I'm going to come back to that, or uh, in terms of this priority, this historical priority. But if there was a historical priority, that doesn't necessarily answer the question today about whether duties pre-exist. Right. So we need to say more about that. There's one other reading of this question, do duties pre-exist rights? And that is a more normative one, by, by which I mean, in this sense, evaluative. Yeah? So it's really a change of the question from do duties pre-exist rights to should duties pre-exist rights? This would be in its more evaluative form. And there are a number of possible ways that one might go about arguing for this, but it would depend, it seems to me, on uh, the telos. What is the goal? What is the objective here of any evaluative claim? So it may be that in certain political formations, authoritarianism, for example, the leaders of the authoritarian state might say duties come first. The duties to the state, to other citizens, to the party, whatever it happens to be, have primacy, have priority. These pre-exist any uh, rights that any individuals, should they have any, uh, have. In other political formations, you might have different accounts of this. So on, on some accounts of socialism, for example, duties would pre-exist rights. The duties of solidarity that one has to uh, the community as a whole are the condition on which any individual rights uh, would operate. So in this normative or evaluative uh, context, it's, it's profoundly argumentative, politically argumentative in a good way. The question of do they precede rights? Well, it's a, a, we, we only answer that by asking the normative question, should they? precede rights in terms of the, the intellectual framework. I might be able to come back to that at the end, but I'm not going to say much more about it just now. So analytically then, normatively, and for me, and, and this is uh, partly explained in the book, uh, 
The third way of looking at this is descriptively. When we try to describe, and this is the sociological aspect, when we try to describe the operation of law uh, and rights and duties in modern, modern society, what do we find? First thing you find is a common claim that we live, at least in the West, in an age of rights. This is the age of rights. Everyone uh, uh, is concerned about the priority of rights, human rights, uh, legal rights, all kinds of rights, that these have priority in the contemporary imaginary. Yeah? Of course they do in terms of it. We have courts of human rights. We don't have courts of human duties. No. That alone should tell us something about the way in which at least the dominant form of thinking about the relation, the relative uh, uh, relation between rights and duties uh, operates. But I think if one looks a bit more deeply here and includes in the normative force fields that surround them, in other words, not just to look at so-called legal law, formal law, but to look at multiple plural sources of normativity, what you begin to find is that that force field, that normative force field is very uneven. So in fact, so I claim uh, here, duties are much more a part of the texture of our everyday life than rights are. And not simply in that waves of duty sense, because that's really talking about formal law, um, but in terms of the, the everyday texture of communication and uh, responsibilities that we have are much more tied to duties than they are to rights. Well, what examples of that? Well, you could think most of our family and friendship relationships are saturated with duties. So we have duties towards our children or towards our, our parents or towards our friends and so on. And the language of rights seems inappropriate there. Whereas the language of duties is certainly a part, uh, a, a key part of that. Yeah. Um, what this suggests, however, when we look at this in these uh, familial or friendship contexts, is, is something important about duties, is that they're not always or necessarily painful. They, they constrict in ways that may be productive as a matter of our self-expression. Yeah? So we have this insight that duties are twofold. What, on the one hand, they bind us, but they can bind us in ways that are problematic, but they can also bind us in ways that help us fulfill our relationships or are part of how we fulfill uh, our well-being in relationships to friends and family and so on. So we may have obligations to our children, but that's a good thing. Yeah? It's a good thing for us and it's a good thing for the children. Likewise with parents or aunts and uncles or friends. Okay, so when we, when we expand our vision here descriptively, we find that in, in these kinds of relationships, but also in morality, in political or communal relationships, even in civil society groupings, that relationships of uh, duty uh, do seem to have a primacy because rights often seem inappropriate uh, within them. Okay, and in ways that are not necessarily contradictory, uh, I should say. Um, there's one other aspect, I, I say a little bit about this in the first chapter of the book, that is good evidence for the priority of duties. And that is our basic linguistic uh, communities. That when we are learning to speak a language or when we are learning in the classroom, it's uh, duties that have a primacy here and rights seem out of place. Why? Because in order to learn to express ourselves, in order to be original, to say something original, or to think something original, we have to have uh, understood the duties that come with linguistic communication. Now, 
Interestingly, uh, Neil McCormick, somebody I can't remember right now, talks about this as something crucial, not just as about uh, the duty of how to construct sentences or how to create meaning, but he says that what this does also is imports certain other duties like the duty to tell the truth or to be honest or uh, to be sincere in communicating. Now, of course, we communicate socially, not always through telling the truth, but sometimes through telling lies. But we need to know the difference between a truth and a lie in order to understand that something is a lie. So through these standards then that we have to uh, uh, operate by, we see that there are certain duties about truth telling, about sincerity and so on. And what McCormick points out about this is that anything that we build on top of that, including great structures such as legal institutions, rely on the priority or the primacy of these duty relationships. The other thing that we get from this is that what does this achieve as interpersonal communication? Something absolutely crucial to any social order, trust. So it's only if we can trust uh, other people in these forms of uh, interaction that we can build up anything, uh, says McCormick, that uh, we can count, of, count as worthwhile. So in that richly textured <laughs> set of communicative forms, linguistic communicative forms, uh, we have, he says, inbuilt uh, the possibility of trust, but it relies on the primacy of duty. So do duties pre-exist rights? Yes, in that sense they do, because the duties of, of, of intercommunication uh, rely on performing these, not so much on rights. These will come uh, 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 in, in a sense in a second <coughs> order. Okay, so we have then uh, a claim that we live in the age of rights. But what I've been suggesting is that there are a number of both historical and sociological features that make this picture slightly more um, uh, complex uh, in, a, in an interesting way. That it may be the case that duties do pre exist, right? Not in that form of a Wolfellian sense, but at least in these senses that I've been talking about. Well, how then do we still understand this age of rights uh, claim? Because it is certainly the case that compared to the pre-modern, early modern, uh, where, where religious cosmologies dominated, I'm talking just about the Christian uh, cosmology here, dominated up until uh, the late Middle Ages, early modern period, Thereafter, rights discourse does uh, achieve a dominance, albeit slowly and unevenly. I can't go into the details here, but one finds it in claims of our shift from natural law to natural rights, to the notion of inalienable rights that one finds, for example, in the revolutions of the, uh, the modern revolutions, the 18th century uh, revolutions. So in that sense, the, there's a priority of rights, there seems to be a shift to the priority of rights and their constitutional grounding in legal form or ultimately as human rights, natural or human rights, uh, in constitutional documents, international declarations and so on. In that sense, it does seem to be the case that we are witness to the deprioritization of duties here. So we seem to have this uh, uh, flip, this shift here. My claim is that that's wrong, or, or at least it's not completely right. And the reason for that, I'll try and give some examples of. But what I have claimed is that duties continue to do much of, if not most of, the work in modern and contemporary societies 
in ways that have gone unnoticed or subterranean. So the dominant language is the language of rights, <clears throat> but the reality is not always, or has not always been thus. Let me uh, give you a couple of examples. Two examples. The first would be with respect to the position of women in the modern era. There's a lovely uh, report of a discussion between John Adams, the American revolutionary uh, constitutionalist, uh, and they're writing the we the people, you know, do whatever. And he gets a letter from his wife, which says, look, all this talk about we the people and we are all equal, she says, um, misses out something very important. She, she says to him, you profess all this, but retain absolute power over women. Right? Mm -hmm. So you've got this, we the people are all equal, etc., etc. But she says, look at the way you're treating women. And he replies to her by saying, well, I can't help but laugh at that. Now, two things you might say, well, it's a kind of weird joke, but the, the other thing is they knew quite well that what they were doing was not enacting equality. If that was true with respect to women in the US, certainly it was also true with respect to slavery. That's clear. Now, what can we take from this? Well, one is that whilst the rhetoric of rights and equal rights in the modern era is uh, clear, the reality is that we have a massive asymmetry with respect to another part of the population. If you include blacks and Native Americans, it becomes the majority of the population for whom duties are primacy, not rights. And that structure is built in to the foundations of modern constitutions. Even if we take a, a quick view of the, the possibility that, that rights equality expand over time, nonetheless, even that would accept that there has been an asymmetry between rights and duties, and that for most of the people, most of the time, they had duties, but they didn't have rights. So that reading of the age of rights then would miss out the reality of the constancy of this subterranean experience of the majority of the population for whom rights and duties were not correlative, but asymmetric. Okay, the second context is related to the first context, and that is the colonial context. Here we've got the priority of duty in colonial subjects that was not in any sense matched by this age of rights measure. So again, we can we can find multiple examples of that, but and I do so in the book. But but the theoretical connection that well, one of them that I make is with Kant. I won't say about that. But the other is with H. L. A. Hart. We're all familiar with H.L.A. Hart and his notion of primary and secondary rule. And he says that the modern legal system is the combination of primary and secondary rule. Primary rules are rules of obligation. Secondary rules are power concern. All very familiar. What was it he said about what he called primitive societies? They only have primary rules, he said. In other words, they only have primary rules of obligation. Now, when one looks at that in the colonial context, and I'm not saying that Hart intended this, what one looks at in the what one finds in the colonial context is that that's exactly how the colonizers understood their relation between the British officials, who had the rule of recognition and power conferring to each other, and the colonial subjects, who had what only obligations. So this notion of the con primitive society was a construct of the colonial legal mentality that said all they are capable of 
is having duties. They're not really capable of having rights or power conferring uh, interaction at all. So I think, I claim unintentionally, Hart captures something nice about the way in which the legal system operates as a matter of officials and the internal act of critical reflective attitude of the officials, whereas the reality is, what does the other condition of the legal system? That the people obey. So for the rest of the people, obligation, duty, meeting their duties is primary. That's all we're interested in. We're not interested in their critical reflective attitudes. Okay. So what we find then is uh, in these two examples is that into the modern era, the start of the modern era, and through continuing through the modern era, uh, is this uh, primacy of duty when we see it in, uh, in a different uh, uh, context. The final example that I want to talk about, maybe we've got five minutes more, is that, uh, is that all right? Yeah. Uh, is this, and this brings us in fact to hybrids. Um, because the other thing that I'm concerned about is uh, that in, descriptively, in terms of our interactions, I've mentioned things like uh, uh, informal or plural sources of normativity, but one of the key ways in which uh, we engage with modern life is through work. And by work, I don't just mean paid employment, I also mean working as students or, or in, in, in workplaces and so on. And of course, the dominant language of rights there is about entitlements to, it may be sick pay, it may be maternity leave, the, the rights, freedom to contract, uh, and so on, that uh, all these are central employment contract, all these are central rights within the, the, the workplace. But we all know that workplaces are not defined completely by rights. The day-to-day -day operation of the workplace depends far more upon us following administrative and bureaucratic dictates in which rights really have no particular role to play. We have line managers, we have governance by numbers, indicators, citations, or whatever it happens to be. They form part, the, the majority of our experience as uh, being in the workplace. So in that sense, uh, to describe the workplace as a place where rights are protected is really important because when rights are not protected in the workplace, it gets even worse. You know? But that's not all that we can say about the workplace. The reality of the workplace is that it's structured by these other forms in which uh, rights play, I claim, uh, a sort of uh, entry point. So we sign the work contract, but that ushers in a whole range of duty-based relationships duty-based structures that are not merely just waves of duty, but are of a complex and combined form that combines the normative force of the legal contract, the rights there, rights and obligations under the law, with non-legal forms of obedience. And this is what I describe as hybrids, hybrids of obligation and obedience uh, ensure that uh, these workplace situations uh, function as they do. There's one other thing that we might say about the workplace, of course, in the modern era, and that is it's structured through a commodity relationship. You know? We sell our labor and we get a wage in return. That's where the contractual relation takes place. But we don't need to be, you know, Karl Marx to realize that that doesn't explain really what's going on at all. What's going on at all is that for most people, most of the time, we have a very unequal relationship in terms of bargaining power. That's been said many times, and I don't want to emphasize that. What I think is more interesting 
is that we have a pre-structuring condition that means that anything above that is structured, uh, is dependent upon this substructure, you might say. What, is, what, am I, what am I saying? That both the worker and the employer has no choice but to look at this as a commodity relationship. In other words, they are bound legally, because it's usually in the law, they are bound to that particular form. So that binding, that unfreedom, structures any possible further freedoms of negotiation or contractual agreement and so on. Yeah. And what's important is, I think, it's not just the worker who has no choice, it's the employer as well. They too are bound to uh, the dictates of this particular economic system. There's one interesting exception to this throughout modernity, and that is domestic labor. Domestic labor, by and large, has not been commodified. So what does that mean? It means, by and large, that domestic labor is free. It doesn't attract a commodity value. Who's it carried out by mainly? Mainly by women. And and real exception. So in that sense, what have we got? We've got a structure that uh, that commodifies, but not entirely. But in that space, in that domestic space, it is best described not as a space of rights, but as a space of duties. So what I'm been suggesting then is that uh, the description of ours as an age of rights is important, but that uh, when we look more closely, we see that, yes, uh, the language of duty has, has, has disappeared or been deprioritized, but the reality of social experience is that it's still largely grounded in uh, a, a duty-based relationship. Samuel Moyne, the Yale legal scholar, has written a couple of essays on, on, on duties. And he says, the great task of our time might well be that we need to modernize duties in a way that is appropriate to the kind of landscape that we are now operating within. In other words, rights can only go so far, but if the modern period is an outlier in terms of uh, it being prioritizing rights, we maybe need to reconnect somehow with uh, the sources of duty that would allow us to uh, rebalance. I come at this slightly differently, more historically. Well, he does it historically, but I suppose I do it more sociologically, as you can see from this. So the question then, what's the answer? Do duties pre-exist rights? Yes and no. There you go. Thanks very much. Thank you.